It's either to assess pelvic floor dysfunction or to study benign pathologies such as fistulae and abscesses or for preoperative staging of uh, tumors. Pelvic floor dysfunction can affect the interior compartment in the form of cystoceles, urinary incontinence, and the middle compartment in the form of uterine prolapse, cul-de-sac abnormalities, posterior compartment as in rectocele, rectal prolapse and intersusception, spastic pelvic floor syndrome, and descending perineal syndrome. So what's the technique of pelvic floor ultrasound? Pelvic floor ultrasound can be done by a transperineal approach or an endoluminal approach, whether endovaginal or endoanal. In the transperineal approach, the patient slides in a dorsal light anatomy position with the knees flexed and the hips slightly flexed and abducted. The probe is uh, placed on the perineum, so we can see this image. Anteriorly, there is the symphysis pupus, followed by the urethra and bladder, then the vagina and uterus, and at last the anal canal and rectum. The ultrasound beam passes through the pubic bone, then the urethra, vagina, and rectum, and we can see this image in the mid-sagittal view. The echogenic structure seen here is the symphysis pupus, and here this is the urethra and urinary bladder, this is the vagina, this is the anal canal and rectum. Posteriorly, this is the fibers of the levator in eye muscle. Pelvic floor ultrasound can help us assess the pelvic organ prolapse. We draw a line along the lower border of the symphysis pupus to assess the relation of each organ to this line, either the bladder neck the uterus and the rectal ampulla, as we can see here. So we can assess the relation of the organs to this line during rest and during straining. As we can see here, in this case, this image is during resting and this image is during straining. Anteriorly here, this is the symphysis pupus, and this is the line. Here, this is the bladder neck, urethra, vagina, anal canal, and this is the rectum, and here the puporectalis muscle can be seen. If we notice the difference between the two images, here in the straining, there is descent of the bladder base with funneling of the urethra, oh, the bladder neck, sorry, and the orientation of the urethra is changed. From here, we can see in the resting it was vertical orientation, Yet here it's a rather horizontal orientation. This is due to marked urethral rotation with changing in the ecogenicity of the urethra, making it not that easy to um, identify. This is the distance that we should measure during resting and during straining. We can measure the degree of urethral rotation by uh, an angle between the line passing through the center of the symphysis pupus and another one passing through the center of the urethra during resting and straining. The difference represents the degree of urethra rotation. We can also measure the retrovesical angle by a line passing through the urethra and the posterior bladder wall. The retrovesical angle helps us to differentiate between green 2 and 3 cystoceles. In green 2 cystoceles, the retrovesical angle is usually more than 140 degrees, and it's associated usually with funneling, which is predictive of uh, stress incontinence in neurodynamics. However, in green 3, the retrovesical angle is usually less than 140, which usually causes urethral kinking and negative impact on urination. Here, this is the symphysis pupus. Please try to concentrate on the movement of the urethra and the bladder in relation to the symphysis pupus and the direction of movement of the urethra. As you can see, there was marked descent of the bladder with total change of the urethral direction from vertical to horizontal. So, 
we can assess pelvic floor prolapse or polyglyphic organs prolapse by drawing this line and measuring the distance from it to the organs. As you can see here, the bladder base, the, uh, the uterus, and the rectal ampoule. However, in the uterus, we have two important points to differentiate, whether it's uterine prolapse or cervical elongation. Garcia suggested that we measure a line from the inferior border of the symphysis pupus to the uterine fundus during resting and straining. If the difference between resting and straining is more than 15 millimeter, then this is a uterine prolapse. If it's less than 15 millimeter, then this is a cervical elongation. Okay. As you can see here in this case, this is during resting. This is the anal canal and rectal ampulla. During straining, there is bulging of the anterior rectal wall into the posterior vagina, forming a rectocele. We can measure here the depth of the rectocele. And here, this is during resting and this is during straining. This is the urethrum bladder, vagina, and here this is the anal canal and rectum. During straining, there is bulging of the small bowel loops between the rectum and the vagina, indicating an interocele. The levator eni muscle can be assessed using transperineal uh, ultrasound, especially with 3D and 4D reconstruction. As you can see here in this image, we can properly assess the muscle, its symmetry on either side and thickness, whether there is interruption on, uh, in the muscle fibers or not. This is the normal appearance of the levator eni muscle. And here, there is defect on the right side of the pupurectalis muscle. Here in this images, we can see the, right, the left sling of the muscle showing a defect that is seen in multiple slices. There was a classification done uh, by uh, Delancey and another one done by Dates to score the degree of the severity of the muscle uh, injury depending on, in Delancey it depends on the percent of the muscle affected on either side and with dates it depends on the number of slices to produce a scoring system to detect the severity. As you can see here, this is normal left sling of the muscle with defect seen here in the right side. The urethral, uh, levator urethral gap can be measured from the urethral lumen to the most medial insertion of uh, the levator in eye muscle to the inferior pupil cramus. It can be helpful in cases of subtle avulsion if the urethral, uh, levator urethral gap is more than 2.5 centimeter. This is indication of an avulsion of the muscle. We can also assess the hiatal distension using the transperineal ultrasound in the plane of minimal hiatal dimension, which is between the lower border of the symphysis pupus and the anorectal junction. We measure the volume of the hiatus, which should not exceed 25 cubic centimeter. We can also assess post-operative slings to see whether this is sling is normally placed or not, or whether there is complication. As we can see here in this image, this is the normal appearance of a sling post-operatively. However, here there is displacement of the left sl um, sling. In transvaginal approach, we can use either the biplane probe, which allows assessment of the urethral complex with length and thickness, the rhabdosphincteric muscle, thickness and volume, as well as the spatial distribution of the urethral vascularity. Or we can use the 360 endoluminal probe, which allows acquisition of 300 transaxial images over an area of 60 millimeter in 60 seconds. Then we use a specific application to uh, be able to visualize the 3D volume taken by moving to and pro to see cranial and caudal axial images or rotate the cube to be able to see the sagittal reconstruction of the images or we can also rotate it in the other direction 
to be able to see the coronal reconstruction of these images. There are four important levels that we have to assess in the endovaginal examination. The first level is where we can see the bladder base at 12 o'clock and the lower rectum at 6 o'clock. The second level is where we can see the uppermost part of the urethra anteriorly at 12 and the anorectal junction posteriorly at 6, with starting of the appearance of the fibers of the pupoviscerales muscles posteriorly here as the heterogeneously echogenic fibers. The third level is where we see the mediurethra anteriorly and the anal canal posteriorly with the pupic bone inferior pupil grimai on either side forming a gothic arch. And in this level, we can see the, assess uh, the attachment of the muscle to the pupic bone on either side. The lowermost level is the level of the superficial perineal muscles, where we can see the uh, superficial transverse perineal muscles and barbocavernosus muscles. So, this is the normal appearance of the levator in eye muscle in the uh, endovaginal ultrasound. And this here is a muscle showing defect in the right sling, uh, sorry, in the left sling of the muscle. In the endoanal approach, we can also use the 360 rotational probe. The patient can be lying in the lateral decubitus, dorsal lysotomy, or prone position. We uh, have to make sure that, uh, according to the clock, anteriorly as, uh, is at 12 o'clock, posteriorly at 6, left at 3, right at 9, to allow proper interpretation of the image. And we assess three levels in the endoanal ultrasound, in the upper, middle, and lower third of the anal canal. In the upper third, we can see uh, the fibers of uh, the puporectalis muscle seen posteriorly at the heterogeneous ecogenicity, rather uh, forming a U-shaped sling. In the middle layer, we can see the inner hypoechoic circular ring of the internal anal sphincter, which is continuous, followed by the heterogeneously ecogenic external anal sphincter. And in the third level, and the lowermost level, we only see the heterogeneously echogenic external anal sphincter. Endoanal ultrasounds allows us to see anal defects, scars, and fistulae. As you can see here in this case, the internal anal sphincter, which is here the anal hypoechoic ring, is interrupted. This interruption is extending from 1 o'clock to 6 o'clock. And there's another hypoechoic collection seen in the intersphincter space and extending to the external anal sphincter. This here is a defect in the internal anal sphincter as well as a fistulous tract. Here in this image, we see the internal anal sphincter as a continuous hypoechoic ring with no evidence of interruption. Yet, in the external anal sphincter here, we can see a hypoechoic collection seen at 12 and at 1 o'clock. And here, in the coronal reconstruction, we can see a fistulous tract in the intersphincteric space breaching the external anal sphincter and extending beyond it. In conclusion, Pelvic floor ultrasound provides a new, simple, and promising way of assessi assessing pelvic floor dysfunction that is useful in pre- and post-operative assessment as well. Yet an overall knowledge of pelvic floor ultrasonography is not widespread, requiring further studies and research. Thank you. <laughs>